In the last month or so, I would have talked one on one with more than two dozen people. And while the basic idea was to understand how investors think, plan, operate and manage their money, the discussions also revealed the many mistakes that we as investors make. So when I sat down to compile a list, it came to 20 common mistakes of which I myself have committed 14 of them. But mistakes are often the best teachers and in this slightly longish video, we shall look at all 20 of them including what could and can be done to avoid the same. You might be aware of most of these but it's still a good checklist to have and if you have friends, colleagues or family members who are new to investing, then do share this video with them as well. Let's begin. Now we are all aware of the fear of investing when things are not looking good. For instance, it took me a good 4-5 years to muster enough courage to get back into the stock markets after I had lost about 50% of my corpus in the 2008 crash. Similarly, there's an entire section of people who often blame their investophobia on the poor Japanese in spite of knowing very well that investing in a broad market index when the P ratio is at 50-60 is nothing but pure stupidity. Unfortunately, there are still many Indians who continue to miss the bus and are consequently losing a lot of wealth in the process. So this was the fear of an all-time low and at the other extreme are people who fear an all-time high which is probably where we are right now. But as we have learned in a previous video, even SIPs that were started at all-time high points have done quite well and have given respectable returns of 10-12%. to 12%. So investing at an all-time low or at an all-time high is still pretty healthy and what one should definitely avoid is a state of hibernation by not investing. Investing without a clear set of goals or objectives can result in poor decision making and consequently below average returns. And while many I spoke to had some idea on what goals they are pursuing and had even put that in writing, however, very few of them had tagged their SIPs or some part of the corpus to those goals. So it's like saying I want 50 lakhs in 10 years for my child's education, but it still remains a pipe dream because you haven't allocated specific SIPs and schemes towards that goal. In my view, this lethargy is where mistakes happen and as I found in one individual's case who had hurriedly allocated some part of his PPF balance as an emergency fund which is definitely not the right way to go about it. So the next time you sit with that excel sheet that has your SIPs, mutual funds, EPF balance etc, do make it a point to assign a goal to each investment and also figure out using standard calculators if the goal is realistic and achievable. Okay, so when I use the word influence, what I'm really referring to here is this entire practice of consulting our parents, an LIC agent, a newspaper article or some stock guru on TV with regards to our financial decisions. And believe me, these people have a lot of sway in the matter and a good example of that is how millions of investors worldwide, including people who are watching this video, never invest in gold because Warren Buffett has said so. So we all would have been influenced by others at some point in time and at least for me these have been costly financial mistakes. Of course it's almost impossible to eliminate influence but here are a couple of things that you can definitely do. Firstly always assess the extent of expertise and the incentive involved that is how much does the person really know and what's his motivation behind it. For example, a number of us would have been approached by a young 23-24 year old bank relationship manager who will try to advise you on mutual funds, gold coins, insurance etc. In most cases, this person is reading out of a document or he or she has a target to achieve and would himself or herself not have invested in any of those instruments. In other words, it is important to recognize that this person might be approaching you with a set of incentives which may not be aligned with your goals and your objectives. A second technique that has always helped me is to populate all the options, all the variables in a nice big table and to then analyze the alternatives on the basis of my requirements. It's something you would have seen in many of my videos and by the time I am done with this, there's a lot more clarity in my head on what and why something should or should not be done. When I was in my 20s, I had this goal of achieving a corpus of 1 crore by the time I hit the age of 30. It's another matter that this didn't happen at 30. It happened a few years later, but it did teach me a lesson that income and wealth are a lot non-linear than what an Excel sheet might present. 
The fact is, we often have unrealistic expectations and this quote from Nicholas Vardy kind of sums up how an average investor thinks and what he or she believes in. But over time, it helps to be realistic about things. And for my own portfolio, a goal of inflation plus 6% really suits me. Another expectation, a realization of sorts, is that the stock markets are a lot more predictable than what we otherwise think. I mean, this image here shows the Nifty 50's journey since the turn of the century. And when I superimpose the Nifty's earnings per share on it, I'm sure we can all see a pattern emerging. To put it in a statement, the stock markets are nothing but a slave to corporate earnings. And as companies in India continue to grow profits at 12, 13, 14% per annum, so will the Indian stock markets for the next decade or more, making this a predictable assessment of the future. Now, half the people I spoke to in the last month or so were ignoring asset allocation. So everyone had chosen their schemes, PPFAS, FlexiCap, Quant small cap, an index fund by Motilal Oswal, etc. But what was clearly missing was a strategy on how each of these funds fits into one's portfolio and how their selection could actually improve their portfolio's risk adjusted returns. Now, I've spoken at length about asset allocation in my previous videos, which includes how a conservative, balanced, or aggressive portfolio might look like. I've also shared my own portfolio allocation. And I also used numbers to show how a diversified portfolio with 60% in equities and some portion in debt and gold would have actually done better than a 100% equity portfolio. Point blank, it makes perfect sense to diversify one's portfolio across different asset classes, industries and geographical regions. And if you haven't been doing that, then it's time to consider asset allocation with immediate effect. Another observation here is that for a majority of mutual fund investors, asset allocation meant purely a division between large caps, mid caps, small caps and international equity. In fact, it's something even I used to do, but as I've learned more, I've realized the importance of using strategies like momentum, value, quality and other factors along with market cap, which not only improves portfolio returns, but also reduces the portfolio's risk and downside. In the first half of 2021, the share price of Bombay Oxygen Investment Company more than doubled in a matter of just two weeks. The reason, as one might have guessed, is the word oxygen. But here's the weird part. This company has discontinued the manufacturing and supply of industrial gases in 2019 itself. And it is now merely an investment holding company, which obviously has nothing to do with supplying oxygen cylinders. So effectively, people had bought into this company without researching it, which is not good because it definitely increases the risk of making a poor investment decision. In fact, I would even argue that a stock IPO and a mutual fund NFO are nothing but leaps of faith as we don't know much about the company or the scheme at that particular point in time. Now, the best way to avoid such mistakes is for new and existing investors to research and analyze companies, mutual funds and other financial products that they are interested in, which is now a lot easier with numerous aggregation websites, screeners, articles and also video content. OK, so let's say you're already invested in five stocks which are doing pretty well. Now you are at some event and you meet the stock market guru who is very visible on TV, YouTube, Twitter, etc. My question to you is, will you ask Guruji in which of these five stocks should you invest more aggressively? Or will you instead ask Guruji, please tell me which other stock I can invest into? Now, I'm not a betting man, but I won't be wrong to deduce that most investors would choose door number two. The point is, today there are an insane number of options ranging from small cases, P2P lending, invoice discounting, agri-investing, fractional real estate, solar investing, etc. And if your choices are not driven by strategy, but by impatience or the craving for trying something new, then more often than not, mistakes will be made and you might end up with a below average return on investment. To protect yourself, I'll suggest you divide your portfolio into a core and a satellite allocation. And instead of jumping onto a new product, a new stock or a new scheme, always compare it with what you already hold and do it in an objective manner. If there is one mistake a majority of investors make, then that's a failure to implement risk management strategies which exposes them to excessive risk and unnecessary losses. Now, there are a number of risk reduction strategies that one can employ. 
For instance, there's of course portfolio buildup that can be done using diversified assets like equity, gold, bonds, real estate, etc. One can also use a stop loss which helps in limiting the downside, especially when buying stocks. There are also a number of exit strategies like profit booking, time-based exits, fundamental triggers, etc. A periodic rebalancing definitely helps in reducing portfolio risk. Avoiding very high P ratio stocks, ignoring penny stocks, etc. are some of the ways of managing risk. In fact, one of the persons I spoke to last week had most of their investment in credit risk funds, which was a bit odd because mathematically the investor is receiving maybe one, one and a half percent extra returns, but he or she is taking a lot more risk by investing in an instrument that lends at least 65% of its assets to companies that have a credit rating of double A or lower. My point is investing is like batting and while trying to play at every ball is one way of going about it, the more successful batsmen are those who exhibit attacking and defending abilities, which is why risk management is something we investors should never ignore. The chances of a stock going up or down over a single day is generally 50-50. This is something you know, this is something I know, and it's also something a stock tipper very clearly understands and he also takes advantage of it. For example, I can shoot an email to a database of 50,000 people saying that Infosys will go up today, while to another 50,000, I say that Infosys stock will actually go down today. Now, obviously one of those things is definitely going to happen. Then the very next day, I pull up the list of those 50,000 people who got it right. I again split them in half and I do the same exercise, this time taking a bet on Reliance Industries. Now at some point, let's say after six successful daily stock tips, I decide to charge a nominal fee of 1000 rupees for my services. And if you're catching my drift, this is pretty much how a bulk of the stock tipping industry works. Additionally, there are the usual scams, the pump and dump schemes, rumors, improper due diligence, basically the perfect recipe delivered via WhatsApp, Telegram, emails, Twitter, business channels, YouTube, etc., which can all lead to poor investment decisions. My suggestion is please avoid stock investment tips altogether and put your faith in your own research and analysis or else utilize the services of a financial advisor. Performance chasing refers to the tendency of investors to buy mutual funds that have recently shown strong performance. The hypothesis here is that if ABC fund has done well in the past, then it should also do well in the future. Now, when I put this to the test across 75 different schemes, the funds, and this might surprise most of you, but the funds which were ranked 1, 2, or 3 in each of the last 9 years, well, almost 50% of them landed up in the bottom half of the table in the very next year. Yes, almost 50%, and if you're wondering why this might be the case, then firstly, a lot of it is to do with the fund manager's investing style, which goes through ups and downs depending on economic conditions. And secondly, when a fund does well, it attracts a lot more investment, which means the fund is probably buying more units at an expensive valuation. So when I look at this from this perspective, relying on past performance can be a bit risky and frustrating, and perhaps a more prudent approach will be to focus on a fund's investment objective, its long-term record, and the fund's consistency, which is where my 2 to 1 approach can come really handy. The next common mistake that again many of us, including me, would have done is to try to time the market. Now obviously this requires the investor to accurately predict when to buy and when to sell, which is extremely difficult to do on a consistent basis. In fact, I would put forward a case that there is no real need to time the market and for this let's look at three individuals who share the title of India's unluckiest investors. So Amar has been investing in the Nifty 50 index every month for the past 15 years, but somehow the day on which he invests, the Nifty tends to be at its highest point. In spite of this poor timing and surprisingly, Amar's CAGR still shows a respectable 13%. Next up is Akbar who invests only once a quarter and that too at its highest point and yet his annualized returns are a decent 12.2%. And finally, there is Anthony who puts in money once a year and that too at the 52 week high point and still his CAGR was a good 
My point is, and especially if you are mostly into mutual funds, then avoid the pitfalls of frequent market timing. And if you want that little extra kick in your returns, then try out some of the more scientific and tested strategies I've already posted on this YouTube channel. All good strategies have periods of strong performance and also some stretches of poor performance, but over time they tend to outperform the market and make investors a lot of money. However, along the way, many investors can become impatient and they often abandon a tried and tested process in search for a better strategy if the results are taking too long. In fact, a 2022 report by Access Mutual Fund reveals that while actively managed equity funds had delivered 19.1% returns over the past 20 years, investors had earned only 13.8%. The same trend was seen with hybrid funds which returned 12.5%, but investors earned only around 7.4%. The main reason for this gap is investor behavior with many people discontinuing their SIPs when the markets fall, with a sizable few even selling their investments in a bid to protect their capital. In other words, many investors tend to overreact to short-term information while the smarter ones who have learned to live with volatility would actually take advantage of it by doubling down on their investments. The same principle applies to your stocks as well and if you have properly researched the company and invested in it, then unless there is a massive change in your investment thesis, there is really no reason for the investor to abandon a potentially strong investment. Alright, so we've all heard of the story on which came first, the chicken or the egg. But what if I were to change it a bit and ask you the same thing, that is which came first, the investment or the justification? Well, one of the strangest things in investing that gets played out repeatedly is that we often invest in something and then we try to convince ourselves why we did what we did. This generally happens when investors are on a hot streak and they become supremely overconfident that their stock selection or market timing abilities are far superior to others. I mean, it's very common to see investors vilifying fund managers over the short term Although in most cases, it's the fund which ends up doing a better job on a portfolio basis. Anyways, overconfidence is bad because it leads to excessive risk taking and unrealistic expectations. And the best way to avoid it is to recognize the limits of one's knowledge and expertise, be thorough in your research, to continue learning, and one should also aim to seek diverse opinions from time to time. The other side of the equation is of course underconfidence and this is where a follow the herd mentality kicks in which involves making investment decisions based on popular trends or market sentiments rather than the careful consideration of underlying fundamentals. This is something I see very often when the IPO of a big company comes along. So companies like Zomato, LIC, Paytm etc. And what's very common to see is that everyone's trying to ask and seek confirmation from each other. But a smart investor does not fall for any of this and bases his or her decision on one's own independent analysis, the understanding of business models, and of course, the investment's risk return expectation. Yet another common trait I found in many of my discussions is the tendency of holding on to poorly performing stocks. Now this behavior is more of an emotion that stems from some sort of attachment or maybe it's a reluctance to accept losses and of course an expectation that the stock will eventually recover. So personally, I follow a 30% stop loss and although I do a lot of research, it is not uncommon for me to see one or two of my stocks actually falling by 30, even 35% from its acquisition price. Of course, what follows is a period of review, of understanding which part of my investment thesis has gone wrong, etc. But if I am too confused, then I generally exit that stock and redeploy that capital into more promising opportunities. In fact, come to think of it, the government actually helps you get rid of the bad stocks by allowing tax loss harvesting, which might not only improve your portfolio, but it also ensures you aren't paying too much tax on your capital gains. The term noise refers to the constant flow of news, opinions, and daily market fluctuations that can impact investor sentiment. Now, the problem with falling for this noise and making investment decisions based on short-term events is that a lot of these decisions are very irrational and therefore can be quite costly. For example, many years ago, there was a price war between Hindustan Unilever and Rohit Safakton's Private Limited. Both these players had slashed their detergent prices and for HUL in particular, it was an impairment of 20% in the category's profit margin. 
Now, as soon as people got to know of this news, the HUL stock went down by corresponding 20%. But what most investors ignored was the fact that this 20% drop was just for the detergent business, which was a small category for HUL and contributed to only 10% of the company's revenue. And the profits on the remaining 90% of the HUL portfolio were normal and growing. So basically the news around the price war was just noise. But as I said, it leads to a lot of irrational behavior which negatively affects the ignorant investor while the smart investor takes advantage of it. In essence, learn to filter out the short term noise. And once you do it, you'll see a remarkable improvement in your decision making. Rebalancing is a crucial step in portfolio management that involves the buying and selling of assets in order to periodically adjust the asset allocation as per the desired mix. So for instance, let's say you have a simple 50-50 portfolio consisting of debt and equity. Now over the years, equities and debt have grown by 15 and 7% respectively, which means if one doesn't rebalance, then over the next 10 years, what was earlier a 50-50 asset mix would actually become a 67-33, which is a completely different risk profile as compared to what you as an investor wanted. The point is rebalancing is extremely important because it reduces risk in your portfolio. It allows investors to capture gains and in controlling losses. Rebalancing also comes with diversification benefits. And in most cases, it also improves the portfolio's risk adjusted returns. So if you haven't been doing it, then I strongly suggest you start rebalancing your portfolio. And unlike what many of us think, this need not be done on a monthly basis. In fact, one or two rebalancing reviews every year is more than enough. And as a suggestion, either do it before the end of a financial year, so February or March, or as I explained in a previous video on my channel, you can also do it once you receive your annual bonus. When I first started investing, so in my early years, I was someone who would never track my investments. Maybe I was under the assumption that everything would be there in some central place, which was definitely not the case. And I still think there are some 30, 40,000 rupees worth of mutual fund investments in my name that are still unaccounted for. Now, from my discussions, I think only about half the people were doing some sort of tracking. And again, many of them were using Microsoft Excel, which is good, but it does have many limitations. Instead, one can explore using platforms like Value Research Online or apps like Grow, ET Money, Fizdom, Ind Money, etc., that can do a better job of it and offer a lot more information, which includes your mutual fund portfolio's XIRR, its asset mix, on which schemes you might be going wrong, etc. With regards to stocks, monitoring the news and announcements coming out of your invested company is extremely important and we saw a glimpse of that when I did a video on Sandur Mangnes and their rights issue. Again, there are many platforms who offer this service and I personally use the watchlist feature on screener.in to be updated with what's happening to my stocks. My point is tracking and monitoring your investments is extremely important as it not only gives you a ready reckoner of what you have, but it also helps you analyze your investments, keeps you updated on the developments and can also assist you in identifying opportunities to grow your wealth. There's an old quote by Warren Buffett that says the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. So everyone has some story in this regard and mine starts with my first investment in Titan in 2004 when the entire company was valued at a mere 300 crores. To put 300 into perspective, the amount of profit Titan earns today in a single month was the market cap of the entire company in 2004. Now Titan looked like a good deal and to my sheer happiness, the money I had invested in this stock had doubled in a matter of just five months. Therefore, I did what a lot of other people would have done and I sold all my shares in Titan at 100% profit only to miss out on 100,000% in profits that the company would have offered over the next 20 years. My point is I showed impatience with the stock and more often than not, the premature selling of investments tantamounts to leaving a lot of money on the table. In fact, look at it this way. Each and every big investor that we know of, Warren Buffett, uh, Munish Pabrai, Rakesh Junjunwala, Peter Lynch and others have all made their wealth by being patient and by adopting a long-term investing mindset, which is what we all as investors need to imbibe. 
Investment fees and expense ratio is always a touchy topic and if you're not careful with it, it can eat a lot into your investment returns. One of the prime comparisons here is the difference between a direct and a regular plan and unless you really need a financial advisor for selecting mutual funds, there is a strong mathematical case in opting for direct plans. A second comparison and a growing one is on actively managed funds versus index funds. So while an active fund charges anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5% in expenses, a typical broad market index funds comes at an expense ratio of just 0.2%. Again, this difference is what gets added into the investment returns. And with most fund managers struggling to beat the index, it's also the reason why passive investing is growing by leaps and bounds all across the world. In that context, my suggestions are as follows. One, always ensure you understand the fee structure of every investment product you hold, especially if you are exploring slightly complex structures like small cases. Secondly, and to the extent possible, try to use direct plans for your SIPs as it will help you in the long run. Explore the use of index funds, especially in the large cap category, and always have a clear understanding of the taxes involved. And the 20th and final mistake I want to highlight in this video is the use of tax as a primary criteria which more often than not turns into a bad investment decision. A good example of this are the many LIC policies that get sold and purchased purely because the maturity amount is tax-free. However, what we fail to understand is that most of these life insurance plans offer anywhere from 5 to 7% returns over 10-15 years of investment, which is just par for the course as far as inflation is concerned. In the same lines is our thought process on capital gains and I know of people who don't sell a profitable stock in the short term because they don't want to pay 15% as short term capital gain but are willing to pay 10% as LTCG even if it means taking in lesser profits. The point I want to make is that taxation is more of an after effect and yes while all investments should be evaluated on a post tax basis making taxation the whole and sole reason for choosing an investment is entirely avoidable. I hope this makes sense and with this I come to the end of this rather long video. I sincerely hope this video has at least provided you with a simple checklist and will form the basis of an improvement in your own portfolio over the coming weeks and months. If you have any questions or if there are mistakes you feel comfortable sharing then please let me know in the comments box below. Once again thank you for your time and I'll see you three days from now. Until then.